Tonight, a popular and experienced Speedway driver dies after crashing in front of spectators in Dalesford. Knifed in the chest, a man found with a stab wound outside a Ringwood nightclub. Tempers flare on the Westgate, two drivers trade blows in the middle of an exit ramp. Hope for struggling households, power bills now forecast to rise less than expected. Reflection and prayer 40 years on from the Ash Wednesday bushfire disaster. And pride on show as a record-breaking midsummer festival goes out with a bang. This is Melbourne's Nine News with Alicia Loxley. Good evening. A popular Speedway driver is tonight being remembered as a top bloke who would do anything for anyone. Stephen Douglas died after his car crashed into an embankment and overturned during a race at Dalesford. Gillian Lanturis reports. Happiest behind the wheel of his Ford Falcon, Stephen Douglas was a fixture on the Speedway. But yesterday when he took to the track, no one expected it would be his final drive. Absolutely shattered, yeah. Affectionately known as Duggo, the 48-year-old was competing at Dalesford Speedway in his second heat when... He's just hit a slight bit of an embankment and it's rolled and, and unfortunately the cars behind have contacted. It's at no one's fault. Stephen was airlifted to the Alfred but couldn't be saved. His passenger Jay Miles was also rushed to hospital with a serious back injury. He doesn't remember a lot from that. Remembers sort of waking up and getting out of the car, sort of lying on the side of the track. The confronting crash played out in front of hundreds of spectators, including children. The Speedway now encouraging anyone struggling to contact Beyond Blue or Headspace. When he wasn't on the track, the Hay Farmer was a staple member of the Poowong CFA. There's nothing he hasn't done for anybody. You know, you need Duggo, he was there. And right beside him was wife Sandra. She would be there wherever Duggo is. They were like, they were best mates. Duggo has been described as the heart and soul of the Nyora Speedway community. To honour his contribution to the club, it will hold a memorial race at their next meet on April 1st. Oh, he was funny. He was just a great top bloke, you know. There was never a day that he was angry. He may have revved his last engine, but Duggo's legacy will never be silenced. He would want everyone to, to go, get, get back to Speedway. You know, don't give up. Just because of this, don't stop. Gillian Lantouris. Nine News. A 21-year-old man suffered life-threatening injuries after a stabbing attack in Ringwood. It happened outside the Void nightclub on the Maroondah Highway just before 3am. An 18-year-old was arrested and remains in custody, but charges are yet to be laid. The victim is now in a stable condition. Stunned motorists have witnessed a violent brawl between two men in the middle of a Westgate freeway exit ramp. Let's go live now to Eliza Rugg at the scene in Spotswood. Eliza, the road rage attack stopped traffic. It did, Alicia, and witnesses have told us this brawl unfolded just before 2 o'clock yesterday afternoon on the Westgate outbound at the exit ramp at Spotswood. There was a driver of a Lynn Fox truck who had blocked a lane of traffic at the intersection at the traffic lights there, so other motorists couldn't get through. That's when the driver of a ute has jumped out of his car to confront the truckie, and both men have ended up punching each other. They were wrestling on the ground there until another driver, a third driver, stepped in to break up the fight. Everyone drove away from the scene. We understand that no calls were made to triple zero, but obviously this was a really ugly road rage incident, Alicia, so police are asking anyone with information to contact them. Yes, of course. OK, Eliza, thank you. Well, six days after earthquakes rocked Turkey and Syria, the death toll now sits at more than 29,000 people, but there are fears that number could double. However, hope is being kept alive by each survivor who's pulled from the wreckage. Brett McLeod has the latest. Their lives spared in a disaster that's killed so many. Survivors now battle injuries, illness and infection. The ship Bayraktar has been transformed from a weapon of war to a floating hospital essential in a region where so much infrastructure has been destroyed. On its first day of operation at the Turkish port of Iskenderun, 500 patients were treated. For some, it was a battle just to get on board. The general recognised window of survival for those trapped following an earthquake is 72 hours. It's now been more than twice that long. Rescue teams are exhausted, their conditions harsh, and still miracles emerge from the rubble. <laughs> Cries heard through layers of concrete led crews to a seven-month-old baby who'd been trapped for 139 hours. 
This little girl plucked from the darkness of a collapsed building after 136 hours. Hassan, who helped pull a family of six and two other people from the rubble yesterday, tells us the rescues make us proud. Asked, when will they stop? He replies, never. Not until the last person is found. The idea that these mountains of rubble still hold people, some of them still alive, many of them dead, we haven't yet begun to really count the ultimate number who may have died. The death toll, already unfathomable, still surging every day. I'm sure it'll double or more. And that's, that's terrifying. Too many bodies for all to be formally identified, but volunteers ensure everyone receives a burial. For many, grief comes with anger. This Syrian man holds the body of his four-year-old son, appealing to the West for more aid. Who is helping us? In Turkey, they're getting everything. What did this child do wrong? In the rebel-held city of Harem, rescues have given way to recovery missions. Help just didn't arrive in time. Tents have been erected metres from demolished houses. It's estimated more than five million people are without shelter in Syria alone. While in Turkey, ships are being prepared as floating dormitories. The extra accommodation can't come soon enough. It's estimated the number of people in Turkey made homeless as a result of the earthquake is over a million in an area surrounded by snow-capped mountains. Turkish leader Erdogan has vowed to rebuild with work starting within weeks. But for two countries brought to their knees and their cities in ruins, restoration will be a slow, gruelling process. In southern Turkey, Brett McLeod, Nine News. And Melbourne's Islamic community is harnessing people power to support the victims of the Turkey and Syria earthquake disaster. Volunteers from the Australian Islamic Centre fired up the barbecues today at a drive through fundraiser in Newport. It's touched everyone's hearts. Everyone in the world is our brother and our sister, so we have to uh, dig deep. The organisation has set itself a goal to raise $5,000. Well, an expected surge in power prices may not eventuate, with data now predicting costs will rise, but much less than originally forecast. It's emerged as the Treasurer flags his May budget will be a combination of relief, repair and restraint. Here's Charles Croucher. With every flick of every switch, every Australian house has felt more pain. But tonight, hope that when the weather cools, so will prices. We have received and published today a really encouraging signs that the energy market expects our energy plan to do its job. Tonight, the forecast is still for prices to rise, but by around 40% less than predicted last year, with the eastern states and South Australia set to receive the biggest benefit. If Australians are being told instead of your power prices going up extremely significantly, they're just going to go up significantly, then good luck with that message. The cost of power and cost of living will form the background for Jim Chalmers' second budget in May. So the three parts of our plan are the three R's. Uh, relief where we can, uh, repair uh, and restraint. Uh, those are the most important things that we can be doing right now. You can't spin your way out of this. This has to be the government's top priority. Treasury, like the Reserve Bank, tonight believe the inflation peak has passed and Australia will stay out of recession. But the weekly shop won't be getting any cheaper anytime soon. Inflation will be higher than we'd like for longer than we'd like. This is a persistent problem in our economy. Last budget, the government identified cheaper medicines as one way of easing the cost of living burden. Tonight, they're being encouraged to offer longer scripts, allowing customers to save more. And I think Australia really needs to look to National Cabinet to say, well, if you're going to talk the talk, we want to see you walk the walk. Charles Croucher, Nine News. Let's go live now to Charles, who's in Canberra. Evening to you, Charles. A timely anniversary tomorrow. Evening, Alicia. Tomorrow marks 15 years since the apology to the stolen generation. This anniversary, though, has significance as the nation grapples with the idea of an Indigenous advisory body or voice to Parliament. Many of those present that day will be back here tomorrow, as will Kevin Rudd, before he takes up his role as Australia's ambassador in Washington. Opposition leader Peter Dutton walked out of the chamber that day. He has since apologised, but with the Liberal Party yet to take a stance on the voice to Tonight, the Indigenous Affairs Minister has warned Mr Dutton not to repeat the mistakes of the past. Alicia. OK, Charles Croucher in Canberra, thank you. 
40 years on, the trauma and tragedy of the Ash Wednesday bushfires still lingers. The CFA today held a memorial service to honour the 47 people who died when entire towns were almost wiped off the map. Mimi Becker has more. For decades hasn't dulled the pain. <laughs> Reflecting on a day that so many would never forget. Ash Wednesday, 1983. But if anybody's trapped in there, God help them. Today, a memorial to mark the 40-year anniversary this week. Days like today are really hard. During a 12-hour rampage, more than 180 fires burned across Victoria. They were found by winds of up to 110 kilometres an hour, the day still vivid for many who were on the front line. You could sort of see through the headlights what houses were left. It was pretty much like a moonscape. It was huge. You'd put out a fire in front of you and you look around behind you and 10 metres, 20 metres behind you would have jumped over. 47 lives were lost, including 14 CFA volunteers. Brian Minette was just five years old. His dad, John, was out battling the blaze, but sadly, he never came home. It uh, sits very well that, you know, Dad save lives before he perished. Very proud to stand here uh, with my CFA family. Dozens of wreaths laid in their honour today. The emotions still raw. Young Peter tried to run a couple of hundred yards in those days, but he couldn't run fast enough. The fire caught him, cauterised his lungs, and he died a few days later. So. That was really sad. Sorry. More than 20,000 hectares burned. Fire tore through 2,000 homes. There, there wasn't anything left. There was like two gas bottles standing, but it was just a pile of, you know, metal and not much else. And the significance of today's commemoration extends to where the service is being held. 40 years ago, a kindergarten stood here and on Ash Wednesday, it provided shelter to nearly 200 people. They huddled under wet blankets as the fire tore through town. Men jumping onto the roof to douse embers in a desperate effort to protect as many lives as possible. The CFA marking the anniversary. To make sure that we reflect but never forget uh, and learn the lessons of the past. Mimi Becker. Nine News. Well, it's party time in Melbourne's inner north where the LGBTQIA plus community has dusted off the glitter for the last day of the Midsummer Festival. And Elizabeth Moss is right in the thick of it. Lucky you, Lizzie. What a wonderful celebration. <laughs> Alicia, welcome to the party. This is where it's happening on Gertrude Street at the moment. As you can see, plenty of glitter. I tell you what, the streets of Melbourne have not been this busy since grand final day celebrations. These people have been partying since this morning and I tell you what, it doesn't look like they're stopping anytime soon. Far from a sleepy Sunday, Gertrude and Smith Street today, the centre of celebrations. Melbourne's Inner North alive and dancing to mark the end of Midsummer. These are the sorts of events that are really important. Visibility reduces the stigma and the discrimination that all too often we as LGBTIQ plus people face. Fitzroy and Collingwood businesses were bathed in the rainbow flag with pop-up performances in some shop fronts. There was even the occasional mermaid. I'm going with this. <laughs> As the city's LGBTIQ plus community, alongside allies, raise their cups. I love how inclusive it is, how celebratory it is, how it brings all of our rainbow communities together. This year's Midsummer is without a doubt the biggest and brightest, yet even just halfway through the festival they'd already sold more tickets than any other year. Record number of marches at the Pride March, record number of attendances at our carnival event. I think it shows that our diverse communities are ready to come out and celebrate. 23 days of parties and pride out with a bang. Happy Pride! Elizabeth Moss, Nine News. It's just wonderful, isn't it? As is this, commuters at Flinders Street Station received a rude shock today when a stream of cyclists rode past in their birthday suits. The World Naked Bike Ride promotes road safety and body, body positivity. The In the Buff Brigade started their journey in Carlton and continued to turn heads as they made their way around the city. 
Well, there's been a rapid response to Australia's India drubbing. Clint Sanaway is here with the latest with his clothes on. Clint, selectors have pulled a wild card. <laughs> Thankfully, yes, Alicia. <laughs> They're desperate to turn things around straight away after that thumping loss. And they think this could be the man to help them. He's pretty confident too. If I do get a chance, it'll be an absolute dream come true. And, and um, yeah, I think, I'm, I think I'll do a pretty decent job over there. Also tonight ahead in sport, a galaxy of stars hit Amy Park for a great cause and Bomber fans should have reason to believe. The storm roll into the Cattery, but this wasn't the start they were looking for. Why the Leicester faithful are starting to go wild about Harry. And is this seat taken? The huge surprise that made this little girl melt. Plus a Carlton favourite details his long road back. That's all coming up soon in Sport Alicia. Plenty to look forward to, Clint. We'll see you very soon. Next in Melbourne's Nine News, a driver charged after colliding with a police car near Ballarat. Rental crisis, some home truths about the holiday letting boom on the Mornington Peninsula. And the charity asking romantics to help spread the love this Valentine's Day.